Thank you very much for a lovely introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conference as one of your keynote speakers. And thank you for getting up so early on a Sunday morning <laughs> to, um, to come and hear me speak. Since um, I'm not a morning person myself, I'm especially appreciative of people who make this extra effort so early. As um, Vanessa said, I will be looking specifically as a content researcher and looking at the analysis of materials that are available for people to um, consider today. And to set the stage, I would like to give a little bit of background in my belief that it is life experiences, and as Vanessa said, my experience as an adult immigrant, it's professional experiences. I'm a former classroom teacher, a school librarian, and a college professor of children's literature. And a person who has a disposition to be interested in everything about the visual world. I'm interested in everything from art museums to photography to signage, and also a person who likes to play with technology. And contextualizing the, my work within the work of other researchers, but there are many of you who will be speaking on these topics in related areas throughout the conference, and so I will not be uh, dipping into your area so much as looking specifically at my area of content analysis. And then also thinking about various audiences. I often address um, people who are my students, or were my students, I guess I now have to say, um, who are practicing teachers and librarians who are coming back for graduate work. I talk to parent groups, and I talk to other researchers, and I also talk to developers, um, authors, illustrators, app developers, and all, to take a look at uh, what all of this means to various audiences. But all together, what I care deeply about is the stories that we have for our children. And whether we see those stories and hear them orally, in print, or through digital mediums, ultimately, for me, it is about the, written, the, the story that is told through words and the story that is told through the visuals. We have worlds that are changing experiences of how things are shared today so that we start out with everything that used to be a book and going into various media and now we have things that start as apps, go to short films, and then ultimately become a book. So sometimes we see things in reverse cycles than patterns of the past. I think this film hardly needs introduction since it was um, an Oscar winner, but I want to go on to talk about what it is that has fueled my own research. I want to also give credit to the fact that I just completed a, a research fellowship at the Prussian Heritage Foundation at the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin, and that has allowed me the time to spend four months of really intensely engaging in work of visual narratives. I also took a look at visual research methodologies outside of my field of picture books to take a look at how people in film, how people who are in various art worlds, and others in psychology are also looking at the ways in which we communicate visually. Of course, I looked at the picture book uh, research that you are all very familiar with as well. Ultimately, I, I brought this all together to what does it mean to the children? Because we are the adults who create them, the adults who curate them, the adults who analyze them, the adults who select them, but what does it mean to the children and how will they respond to the literature? There are many frameworks for taking a look at this, but I particularly looked at this particular one by Martin Salisbury and uh, Morag Stiles in children's picture books, The Art of Visual Storytelling, to look at elements of how children respond to picture books. But in addition to this, I realized that ultimately it all comes down to three areas that I focused in, which was that the what of reader response is to be found in comprehension and whether children can and how well they can understand the text and understand the visual. How much do they take in from the text and how much do they take in from the visual? And in picture book research, we know that it's not just text and visual separately, but certainly the interplay between the two. But I also wanted to consider the aesthetic experience, because many stories are told in ways that are not particularly aesthetically pleasing and are of high quality. And so I kept this as an important consideration as I looked at the material that I was analyzing. And finally, 
I took a look at the role of motivation and engagement, especially important in this digital era because I keep hearing people saying that uh, the role of digital media has been frequently that of enticing children and holding their attention in this digital age, children who are looking for multimedia experiences. But I also wanted to see, does it in fact enhance or does it disrupt? the child's experience. So altogether, the three main areas in which I looked at the reader response were those. As Vanessa has generously introduced, I have three co-authored children's literature textbooks, and so often my research has led me to a better understanding in doing my own thinking and reading and writing. I also want to consider the fact that we don't gain our visual understanding or our st understanding of story from just one source, but that we have multiple in uh, sources of inspiration in our adult lives, and I believe, of course, that children do as well. So therefore, um, I became involved in going to various film festivals, going to various uh, film screenings and such, because what I found is that the discussion afterwards helped me to understand how filmmakers were creating films for various audiences. What was particularly enlightening to me was to go to films that were made by cultures that I had less experience interacting with because it was a peek into a way of thinking, a way of visualizing, a way of expressing that were sometimes very culturally bound. For example, when I watched this film um, called The Himalayas or The Wind Dwells, a Korean film, I found that the discussion afterwards was commonly referring to the filmmaker as being unfriendly to his audience. And when I probed that concept deeper, what I came to understand was that in my world of reading research, we would call it inconsiderate narrative, and in this case, inconsiderate visual narrative is how I've chosen to dub this. And the reason why I'm calling it inconsiderate visual narrative is because in textual analysis, we often talk about inconsiderate narrative as being narrative that doesn't give the background to the, the reader to be able to enter the narrative and understand it. So in this particular case, what happened was that the film was set in, um, up in the Himalayan mountains, and I knew from the first instance in the film, one of the opening scenes, that someone had died and the ashes were being delivered to the family. I happened to go to this particular film screening with an Italian friend, very astute film student. He completely missed that and didn't know someone had died until about two-thirds of the way into the film. Why? There was one cue that I recognized in the beginning that he didn't recognize because my culture experience led me to understand that the box, the wooden box that was wrapped in white and tied a particular way had ashes in it and he didn't know this particular visual cue. So again, through film, through books, through uh, many experiences, we come to deeper understandings of visual narratives. And this again helps me to look at picture books as well. I started in looking at some very traditional and familiar books that were in Germany. Um, one that the people say many people in Germany grew up with, and it was commonly found. Do any of you recognize this cover in this book? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Some of you? I looked at this one story, and it said Rapunzel. I don't read German, although I'm very good with a menu. But I looked at this, the illustrations, and I thought, I don't recognize this story as Rapunzel. Why is that? What was I looking for, do you think? that long hair. Well, it wasn't there. <laughs> so I found this to be a story that for me didn't fit with my understanding of what my expectations were in this particular illustration. On the other hand, a very non-traditional and a contemporary and um, avant-garde way of telling the story was in the Rothschild Suzanne Bernau's um, book here. And if you look at the, her graphic information here, without understanding the text, you can take a look and understand clearly what's happening, that this is, in fact, the Rapunzel story. How do we know? There it is, the long hair. <laughs> it tells me that this is the story of Rapunzel. But if you follow the visual sequence, you suddenly come to this scene in the center on the right-hand side that is very not in my Rapunzel stories that I knew. <laughs> but I know what's happening in this story on this particular page. And when I see that visual cue, it's important for me to recognize it because otherwise I wouldn't be able to understand the next page, which is why when the prince finds her years later, 
She has two children and they call him Papa. <laughs> so um, the importance of understanding the visuals is particularly important in a situation like this when language was not an option for me. Sometimes I found wordless stories that were clever but very perplexing that I, I spent hours trying to figure out and I never could quite figure it out other than that I thought it was cleverly moving from one to the other. I couldn't follow the sequence to understand the story. If somebody does, please enlighten me afterwards so that I can come to a, a better understanding of this. Or others in which, again, I looked at another wordless book and could see easily what was happening, even though, again, it didn't really make sense to me. I understood what the communicated um, story was in this particular case. Um, others, such as this one, taking a look at a very contemporary, iconic view of explaining there is no doubt what's happening in this story because the way in which we communicate through icons throughout the world is clearly expressed in this particular telling. I was very fortunate to have experiences of being on some illustration juries and really analyzing illustration that communicated strictly through five visual sequences. And so through five pieces of art, I had to try to make sense of what was being communicated by the illustrator. Out of 3,200 submissions, we chose 80. This was one in which I felt that Sonia Danowski's um, ability to portray a child's feeling of moving was clearly expressed through the illustrations. Moving to a new home and the loneliness there. Leaving friends behind, all of that is pretty obvious, I think, in these illustrations. Or again, I was on the NAMI, um, the, an Asian setting, the Korean NAMI Island International Illustration Concour, in which we took a look at 619 entries. And again, to look at the differences in which ways people communicate. Even though both were international, <coughs> clearly one was very European in the entries, and the other one was very Asian in the number of entries that were put there. So looking again at more ways of understanding visuals, I encourage people all around me to look at all aspects of how v visuals are communicated, not only through the picture books. In one month, I saw five different performances of um, Mozart's uh, Magic Flute, and three of them in Berlin. And of the three, I took a look at the th particular instance in which we were to understand the Queen of the Night commanding Tamino to save her daughter. And if you look at the three, the stance of the two characters communicates so much in terms of who's going to be heard and who's giving a command that's going to be absolutely adhered to. I thought this was a very dramatic way of looking at how through opera, again, even though if you don't understand the language, you can understand the visuals and the music as being a musical way of auditorially understanding the story. Um, I also took a look at some of the foundations and understand that the digital medium has foundations in push and pull tabs, things that are move, found movements by uh, pulling on tabs or pulling and pushing, or ways in which we look at things that move. This is in the primitive days when I'm still using my camera in, uh, from the computer to uh, film things. <laughs> Only a few months ago I was still doing this. <laughs> and again, you can tell these are dated images because of the culturally, um, culturally stereotyped types of <laughs> illustrations you see throughout this, but ways in which they use templates and all to communicate. But cultural things, that's a whole other story, not right now. So sound, um, movement, and all in materials from 1800s, early 1900s. Things like this that were done in paper that we see done digitally now. Now, a researcher always keeps ears perked at all instances, right? <laughs> I, was I was on a train coming from um, Brussels to Maastricht when our train was delayed, and we missed the connecting train. But fortunately, I ran into two people who were also going to Maastricht and were at this beautiful train station waiting for the train to come. And so we got in a conversation about, why are you going to Maastricht? Why are you going to Maastricht? <laughs> and in it, um, I started talking about the research that I was doing. And I, he wanted to see what the demonstration of what it was. So I took out my iPad, and I'm having a little demonstration sitting at the train station. And he said, why do you have the sound turned off? And I said, because it makes so much noise when we're in a public place like this. 
He said, no, no, I have to hear the sound. And it turned out that he is a sound engineer. And so he started doing an analysis of all of the aspects of the app that I had not considered as deeply. So I learned a lot. I immediately took out my notes and started typing away, sitting at the train station, notes on how to further understand and analyze for sound effect, the, the input of background music, the appropriateness of the background music to the app that was being developed, the mixing balance, why in some cases the music was a little bit too loud and overpowered the voice, why in other cases um, it was important to think about such things as voice identity of a particular character, all of these things that we had an hour-long discussion on, which I found to be quite intriguing. And, and the app that started all of this was Freight Train by Donald Cruz, and a beautiful picture book that expresses motion beautifully in print that does not move you would think that it would be a perfect choice to go into a digital moving device. However, this one is poorly done for all the reasons that the sound engineer and I talked about this, Oliver, and I talked about um, what doesn't work. From a picture book visual perspective, what doesn't work about this for me is that it starts with the caboose and goes completely backwards, and we don't see the train going in the direction in which it should go ultimately at the end of the story. But there are many picture books that we find with strong visual narrative. When I talk about my research as being what works well where when, I want to consider the fact that there are some stories that really are so beautifully and well told in print, especially in the way that they've been developed, that they deserve to stay in their print format. For example, when we take a look at this um, Caldecott award winning book, my husband was on this particular Caldecott committee, um, the Man Who Walked Between the Towers. These are the twin towers that no longer exist in New York City. And it's the story of the man who walked between the two. And when you see the front cover, you are placed on top of the wire, along with the walker, looking down into the city of New York. That front cover is dramatic because of the height of the book, and you feel the height of the skyscraper and the distance down to the ground by seeing this very dramatically tall book. However, if you were to look at the entire cover front and back, you get a sense of the balancing and the weight put being put on the foot that is moving forward, and you get a, a bigger spread of the space between the two towers. But then, when the illustrator, Mordecai Gerstein, wanted to express the distance instead of the height, he was cleverly able to create a way of showing distance by making those panoramic slices across the double spread. This is something that was a very important consideration in designing a beautiful book as it is. And to take this design apart and to make the images standardized in one size tablet would be to lose what had been developed as a beautiful picture book. Or the very dramatic story, The Middle Passage by Tom Feelings, where Tom Feelings cleverly places the reader as if the reader were joining the journey that's about to happen. You as the reader are pulled into the story by this dramatic cover. Throughout this wordless book, except for the opening sequence that explains what's happening, um, you are brought as a, a passenger on the horrendous journey that's going to happen between the West African nations and um, the Americas. On the other hand, I think about some books that are told through print that have a strong visual narrative and because of the content. I believe that a book in print may be the best way to communicate a story. I'm not sure that in things that have sound, things that have movement, would be appropriate or even safe when a child is entering a book that has a very dramatically told story such as this. My daughter was only nine years old at the time she read Middle Passage, the book I showed you earlier. And it's a book that really is for a much older audience, I believe, on one level, because you see rape scenes and beatings and very violent scenes in the book. But I felt that in a book, she could handle the space that the book allowed her, whereas in a movie, it flashes in front of you and you're inundated by sound and movement that you cannot escape from. So books that deal with issues such as this one, in which we're dealing with an adult anger, a very violent situation in which a child might feel threatened, a picture book in print might be the best place to look at how the story unfolds. 
or one like this that might seem very childlike on one level until you start to understand the way in which she is demanding through the very important double spread, not just a single page at a time, but through the double spread, her wondering, had they heard, have other people heard what happened? And then showing her dead pet inside her red bag. She's so engulfed by her grief through it all. And when the other characters follow her, and she's able to say her goodbyes, this very important page shows her red purse buried. She's walking away, saying goodbye, and able to leave the scene and feeling that safety of the situation that's expressed here. To me, again, I think this is a book that I like feeling the page sequencing of flipping the page and sitting with that double spread page by page. Or in this one, in which we have a mother who sort of loses it. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't, so she completely loses it. And the poor child sort of falls apart, literally. <laughs> and in a humorous but somewhat realistic way of thinking about what happens to children when they feel sort of blown apart by what, has, what they have been faced with, the body parts seem to have gone to all over the world. I covered up the text on purpose because I, I don't um, read, it, the text is in German. But what I understand through this is that the mother does gather up all the pieces, puts the child back together again, apologizes, and then they continue on with a relationship that happens. And to me, again, this is a book that I want to see for its emotional safety in a space such as this. An another one that has been somewhat controversial, in fact, from what people tell me in Germany, is about a child of um, a somewhat lower e socioeconomic status, but sitting in a room full of newspapers and the parents not communicating to anyone, and certainly not with each other, and the child imaginatively starts to create on the wall. But the one mother that we see three times, busily moving around the room, is putting away and cleaning up all of his creations on the wall. He continues, though, and just like in somewhat of that where the wild things are kind of double spread where you really engage in that imaginary world, he has completely engaged in his imaginary world, becoming quite bug-like in his own appearance. But in this page, when we see the father addressing the child, and then we see that he himself has started engaging in the child's imaginary play, what we start seeing is the mother, with just her eyes and a slight change in her body language, considering and thinking about how she might join in. Then there are some books that have been made into ebooks, have actually been made into it, but I find that when they take a double page spread and put it on a tablet screen, and they want you to keep wiggling it back and forth, like in this Japanese original that was translated into English, I find it to be bothersome because you have to go back and forth because you can tell it wasn't designed for that format. This is another type of feature that I think doesn't belong there. I would like to show you a very short clip out of one that is found in virtually every public library in the United States. And with the use of your public library um, <coughs> card, you can also access it any time of day and night and from any library and any, any place where you have a computer internet access, you can uh, tag into the TumblePad movies. I'd like to show you a part of it and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so when I was showing this to a group of teachers and librarians, I had them write down what was on their minds, and they did a sort of a write, not a think aloud, but a write along as they were viewing it on what was on their minds as they were viewing it. And interestingly, the reading teachers in the group, people who were going to be specialists working with children having reading difficulty, they really liked the fact that it had a consistency of font that it had text that was going to be highlighted as it was read aloud. They liked the reading aloud to go with. They had positive thing after positive thing after positive thing to say about it because they were teachers of reading. Interestingly, in the same group, I had some librarians. And they were saying, you know, but I don't like the way the text covers up the illustrations. I don't think that could possibly be true in the original one. Why does the, why does the text pop up like that? 
And so they asked a lot of questions that were much more about the illustrations as being a way of communicating as well. So what I would like to do is, sh is um, show you the book. But before I do that, you notice how there was that little melody at the beginning? And that there's this template that you see up there? What's happening in libraries such as this is that the creator of these curated collections creates their own template as if it's their own branding. And that becomes the shape of everything that goes into their library. It doesn't matter if the book was a 10 and a half extra long, you know, in library talk, which is a really wide book that you had to put a Mylar cover on, or if it was the, you know, 15 inch oversized book, it all fits into this shape. So let's take a look at the book. The original book is The Journey of Oliver K. Woodman, and here's the cover illustration. And on the cover, we have a very important image in that if you know the hitchhiking history of some of this, the California or bust sign that's up here, the long road and the perspective shows that it is, in fact, a long distance shown on this road. But also, the journey shape of that wide book is taking place here. You see the little purple area where the flap would, front flap would be coming over. But the fact that you see the 48 contiguous United States states showing implies that it's going to be, I don't know what happened, <laughs> Impl <laughs> implies that it's going to be a, um, a hmm. <laughs> is it back up? OK, <laughs> here we are. Implies that it's going to be a journey that's going to go a long distance across probably many states. Otherwise, they wouldn't show all of these states. This is really great when you have people pop up to help you when something <laughs> goes wrong. Maybe I can take them with me to other places, too. <laughs> um, before the story even begins, what we see is a stamp. And I realize that very soon, our children will not even know what a stamp's purpose is. But we see a stamp on here. And we see a, a child sitting at a desk, writing a letter handing the letter to a mail carrier and the mail carrier leaving, presumably, on the mail truck. All of this before we start the page in which the ebook version started. So the leading up to the story, which we all know in our world of children's literature is so important, was completely left out as being extra information that was not necessary by the ebook developer. But what I find to be also disturbing is the fact that here, Text is also part of the art. The way in which the paper is printed, the way in which the paper is folded, the way in which the um, letter is formatted, the, the fact that there's sometimes postcards. These are all part of the art of the picture book. But this page, to me, is the singular page that I find to be most profound in the difference between the e-book and the print book. There are no words on it. but. It's emotionally the page of impact. Because when you understand the concept of hitchhiking, that you're dropped off whenever the person who has been driving you is going a different way, and then you have to wait for somebody else to come along. If you're out in the desert, you don't know for sure who might come along and how long it might be, and if somebody will come along and take you somewhere. There's an enormous sense of loneliness, fear, and worry of being alone. And this is so well portrayed in the tiny little man in the big open space. The pink sky giving us a sense of hope that it's not a doomsday kind of sense, but still a very important page. On the ebook version, because again, they scrunch it into that same little shape, they can only show one portion at a time, not even one side at a time. And in this particular case, they show it in reverse order. This is the final end papers of the book. The end paper summarizes the journey that Oliver takes through the little squiggly dotted places. And all those little dots are the places from which the postcards and letters are sent. The arc that goes across the top is the plane ride taken by Uncle Ray when he goes to visit um, Tamika at the end of the summer. From my own multicultural analysis, I also find it nice to see a biracial child depicted but that's not the point of the story, nor is it talked about. It just, when you look at the illustration, you notice that the mother is one race and the father is a different race, and we have a biracial child. 
as a parent of a biracial child, I like it when things like that are not always the subject of some kind of bibliotherapeutic story, but rather just included in a more natural way. There are design features, though, that happen in other books that make it likely to be successful. And these are the two things that I think are particularly important in the analysis of the ebooks that I have looked at. And one is that there are features that thrive, not just survive, but thrive from being freed of page boundaries. The printed picture book is necessarily 32 pages long, or in multiples of 16, because of the way that the printing press and the printing and all of that is set up. However, with digital books, we don't have to have those kind of parameters. It can be as few or as many as it takes to tell a story. There are some features that are better shown or experience through movement. I've come to understand this more and more in my adult life as well. When I want to know how to do something, I look at, for a video, yes, YouTube, <laughs> in other ways. And I think that younger generations do that even more. I was talking to my niece, my niece who was living with me this summer, and she's 20 years old, and she said, oh, yeah, I always look up a video on how to do anything from how to tie an obi, the, you know, the wide belt part of a Japanese kimono, to um, how to knit. She said, it's just so easy to look it up on a video. Well, what is better shown and experienced through the movement being depicted? Here's a book that is one that I would say has features that make it likely to be successful in a digital world. And let's look at what some of those features are. This is a book that I can almost hear the sounds of the water and feel the movement of that river as I look at this page. When I see lists like this, I can see how they would pop up one at a time and revealed as it's being told so that it would keep the person's attention at a particular place. In this one, I can see, and in fact in the digital book that was made, that there's movement that continues on and on so that you know that when it says every day is the same, we don't want just seven trees. We want to see those seven trees going around and around and around to go even more than a week to show the multiples of weeks that might be shown. And you don't lose a tree entire trunk in the gutter of a book. So what you start to see is you know, the movement of that, that um, the minute hand going up like this in increments so that we can see, although again, I think in another generation they won't even know what <laughs> clocks of the hands are like. But this one, if you want to know what is in Scaredy Squirrel's preparedness kit, can't you think that it would be fun to take your finger and to erase away and take an x-ray vision inside to see what's inside that actual kit? More and more features that show easily how you could pop up certain parts at a time and being able to express. But then when that killer bee appears and he discovers he's a flying squirrel, wouldn't it be fun to see this in movement? So again, a feature that would thrive from being not bound to print, but rather able to develop more carefully through um, moving and sound. And again, that little score, 5.7, and that kind of Olympic-like um, scoring and you know, sports-like thing that comes up, if it popped up after he landed, again, to give more impact. So those are the kinds of features that I think that could um, be readily made into a good app world. Designs of e-picture books that are created from published books have originally been from the historical point, usually page-by-page -page scans. One of the earliest digital um, books and libraries that was connected was from the International Children's Digital Library, the ICDL, that probably many of you have either known about, participated in, or have um, engaged with over the years. It was one of the earliest ways in which we could access books from many countries. Um, it scanned every page of every book, for the good and for the bad, but that's a whole other story. Then there are some that were using film-like panning, but it meant that the camera holder would be the editor of what was going to have attention. So as you saw that panning across the page and the zooming in and out, somebody was directing the viewer's attention and the child choosing how long to linger in different parts. And as we all have different ways of needing to understand better, it would be like going to an art museum and having a film director show for you what part you should focus your attention on rather than you being able to be the one who chooses what to know. Newer ones show alterations to text, where, as you saw from the um, example of the Oliver Woodman one, there are differences in where the font is placed, or even the font that's chosen, apart from the font is art. 
voiceovers and links are added, and then there are interactive features that are added, and I will show you examples of all of this in just a few minutes. ICDL, which I've talked about a little bit already, this concept of content curation has been driving more and more libraries to pop up. Content curation has become so important that because there are so many materials out there, this whole idea of finding, tagging, rating, commenting, updating, contextualizing is an important part of why people put together libraries. This is one of the earlier libraries that came out um, called One More Story, and what they did is also they scanned books. And they scanned the book and set them to background music, had a reader, sorry, and we have a little worm that comes and talks to you. <laughs> okay, we're going to choose. <laughs> So again, you can see how the reading teacher would be very impressed with the fact that the text is on the same place in every book and every page, always along the bottom, same font, the, re the um, lettering is highlighted and so forth. So from a literacy learner's perspective, perhaps it has some value. But for those of us who understand that picture books are conceptualized as a whole, <laughs> taking about part of it and putting it in a place that it wasn't intended to be is rather worrisome as being defacing a piece of art that was developed for a specific purpose. What we start to see is empty holes in spaces. We start to see that some pages are uneven because they have cut the text out and placed them in different ways. But again, we are seeing more and more of these collections of materials because they have been curated. One More Story attempts not to have many. They choose to have a boutique line. So they will only put in a certain number, I think their magic number is 100, and once they reach 100, then they start replacing. So they'll take something out by putting something new in. Whereas other places just keep adding and adding and adding. Their goal is numbers, not quality. Those kinds of places, it's so hard for me to find the one or two that might be good because I have to wade through hundreds to get to that one or two of a title that I even recognize. Then there are things that are called e-libraries and e-books, but when we look at them, we can tell that they are marketed for schools, they are targeted in how they are created as being for learning how to read, and they serve a particular purpose, but they are not what we would call children's literature. They are readers that are used in schools for the purpose of teaching reading. Another one that I found that was also largely the same way, and I could also see the appeal in finding something that had things that were leveled, things that were um, increasing in difficulty. However, when I took a closer look, it was interesting for me that they always announced the author's name on the cover, but then the illustrator was not known until after you got inside. The illustrator's name was not read aloud, even if it was on the cover, it was not read aloud. So that immediately discounted my <laughs> Um, adherence to that one, but you could see how the choices that are made are very school-like in this. This is not meant for a more trade type of um, library. Some have no text even showing. It's completely a read aloud. They have activities that are very school-like activities, putting things in order, putting uh, matching things, looking for sounds and so forth. But finally, I want to show you some of the story apps that have really been game changers in the interactivity. Jackie referred to um, story apps yesterday as being that which has brought in that whole idea of being able to change what's in the um, tablet to start with and being able to interact. And those are some of the things that I'd like to look at now. What is it we are now considering that wasn't of consideration perhaps before? We always looked at words and illustrations and design features when we were looking at picture books. But what are the digital design features and how do we need to consider them? And how do they make sense? in today's world. Parents and educators are always asking, where do I find the best apps? Where do I find the, you know, the interactive features? And there are abundances of websites and magazines and newspapers and articles that are always recommending them. However, 
they're being reviewed by people who I don't believe are so much people who are really from the children's literature world. They largely tend to be people who are educators, who understand perhaps how children learn, but the purpose for which they evaluate is not from a literary or an aesthetic point of view. Um, my husband and I just finished getting an article that's in press. We've posted it on academia.ed if you want to take a closer look at it, but many of the um, slides I have here are included in that. But we take a look at making informed choices, but because what we believe is that when you make an informed choice, what you realize is that sometimes you choose for the purpose of an aesthetic experience, sometimes you choose for a literary experience, sometimes you choose for an experience that is to support a children's developing reading experiences. And those kinds of things um, change why we make certain choices. So again, please don't try to write all of this down, but these are the kinds of things that we address in the article in taking a look at what is it that we need to look at that is evaluation and se selection criteria that comes from the literary and the visual world as we know it prior to it becoming digital. But in the digital world, specifically what happens, which is looking at the presentation of it in digital format and whether it allows those digital format and features to be um, appropriately taken advantage of, the maintaining the integrity of the story, the supplementary features aligning, and all of this making sense in terms of how children read. But my focus is really looking at, again at the content analysis of all of this. In the content analysis of it, I want to think about what's useful and what are gimmicks and what helps children understand, keeps them engaged and motivated, and what may, in fact, disrupt their learning. So with these three main aspects of the question, I want to take a look at some apps that I would like to um, show to you. Okay. This is one that has gotten all kinds of rave reviews and has been highly um, sought as being the number one iPad app and declared a high quality one by many people. However, I am sure that Beatrix Potter would not approve of this particular <laughs> app. <laughs> she intended little books for little hands, as we know, and this is not a little book for a little hand. I watched a grandmother and a grandchild interacting with this particular one, and as they interacted with it, the child became so engaged, so motivated, so that would be like on a really high level, but the motivation and the engagement was with popping the leaves before they hit the bottom and splatting these blackberries. The engagement was not with the story. So this is feature that I cannot find a single negative review on this, and yet I find it to be enormously um, problematic as a children's literature person that something like this gets high marks as an app. I don't want children to be playing with this one. Or something like this heart and bottle that Jackie referred to yesterday in which um, there are features that work in this and features that I think are somewhat questionable. For example, what I, the story itself is, a, I think, a little bit hard for, uh, for a child level to think about. But right there it says, hint, tap if you get stuck. As soon as the child knows that there's a, if you tap that and they tell you exactly where to go to find it, that happens before they even try to find them on their own. So as soon as that hint thing is revealed, every page no longer becomes an exploration, but rather they go straight to the hint and follow it. However, what you do is quite clever, because in this page, if you nudge the grandfather's elbow, then he pushes the little girl and she goes racing across the screen on her tricycle. But what I have never understood is why when you touch his hat, you see that there's a bird on his head. That to me doesn't really make a lot of sense. But very creative is this one that Jackie also referred to yesterday, in which you get to pick your crayon color, draw whatever picture you want, and on the next page, it's on the wall. I should have signed it, but I drew a little face, and there it was on the wall on the next page. And that kind of interactivity, I think, that makes sense for the story's flow and the movement makes the story go to the next level, I think, is one that makes sense. Then there are some that are deceptive because the advertisement promises to be what the cat in the hat does well, which is to practice reading and learning how to read. So the parent who says, oh, the cat in the hat book, I remember that. That's a great book for helping kids learn how to read. It's really fun. Let's buy this app. Oh, it's only $2.99 because, you know, apps are really quite inexpensive compared to the print book. 
and it says that it's top selling, words are going to be highlighted, you can learn individual words, but let's take a look at what you actually do see when you look at it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had a little lead time on this one. We have features that you can choose, and... The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. So we sat in the house on a cold, cold, wet day. So far, fairly true to the book, right? Tree. House. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but this is the confusing page. We sat there, we two, and I said, how I wish we had something to do. Sat. Sat? I tapped the tennis House. racket. House. House. <laughs> so this is one of the lowest level ones. The, some of the others are much worse because they have entire <laughs> phrases that come up, nonsense phrases, because, you know, that's what's a lot of in the Dr. Seuss kinds of books is they make up these little nonsense phrases for you to decode. Well, the problem is there's no need for a child to ever know that nonsense phrase with some string in the picture, and it's not consistent. Are we talking about verbs? Are we talking about nouns? Are we talking about, it, it just doesn't make sense. And what, when you touch the floor and it says house, and you touch the wall and it says house, and you touch the, the uh, is that a table? Is that a heater thing? Whatever that is, and that's also a house? It's very confusing, I think, to look at something like this. But sat also is confusing when you touch a chair. So. Anyway, Dr. Seuss does not deliver what he promises. On the other hand, something that we look at as being a grocery store little golden book that costs only 59 cents when I was a child, and you um, take a look at a, a very mass media, commercially prepared material. However, I have to say it was one of the earliest apps that I found that was an interactive experience that made sense for how the story unfolded. So I'd like to show you a very brief clip from this one. I think. So you can see how the engagement with this is directly with the book and the reader, and everything that happens is going to take place in helping the child to come to a better understanding of how the story is going to take place. I mean, he actually reads aloud all this stuff about who the author is, who's the illustrator, and all of that as he goes on. But um, I want to get to the next part of the book because if you know this particular story, he keeps warning you, don't turn the page because there's going to be a monster at the end of the book. Whatever you do, don't turn the page. So then he says, listen, I have an idea. If you do not turn any pages, So his action, again, goes along with what he wants you to think about in the story. But the clever child would notice that there are little things that you can touch. So he makes brick walls, he makes, you know, it goes on and on and on where he makes things and the child has to use a finger and touch to break down the barriers to get to the end of the book. Again, every action makes sense and this is a case where the app is much more engaging, motivating for a purpose that is to propel the story along. So 
my um, looking down my nose at mass media things took a little bit of a, oh, I think this one is well done. <laughs> Look at it all. Um, there's a book that I found here from, uh, in, written in the Dutch version by Klaus Verplanke and R Ryan Visser. And Timo and the Magical Picture Book was one that has uh, features that make sense in every way. This is um, a book in which of all of the ones that I had looked at, everything in the book was conducive to being made into an iPad version because the actions made sense. Things floated because they were supposed to float. Things were shaken because they were supposed to have sound. And so the movement and sound and everything fell into place in propelling the story forward. A whole area of research that I would have only begun to consider is that of translation. And I think that in my past I have done some translation analysis of Japanese picture books that have been translated into English and with my research partner, Japanese picture books that have been translated into German. However, what we're finding is that because people can do um, picture books in translation much more accessibly than they could in print, you know, the complaint that we always heard in many countries about it's too expensive to make so many language versions, it won't sell in our country, we lose money when we make them in different language editions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you do it in a digital format, this is one of the things that greatly benefits from a digital world. However, right now, there's still a long way to go because we who have been looking at translation theory need to be louder in saying you still have to have a good translator it just can't be someone who happens to know that language natively so that it's accurate, but not literary, not in the storybook language of the new um, language. And even the line breaks of this one make it hard to read because it doesn't make sense in the way in which storybook text should be written out. So this is a book that was originally written in Turkey and made available for a much more international audience. And I applaud the fact that a picture book from Turkey is now widely available in the world in different languages. But I hope that the translation um, aspect will gain more momentum and we'll see higher levels. Personalization happens in some of these. For example, what we see here is an absent parent, aunt, uncle, teacher, anyone who wants to read a book out loud can then read a book and... <laughs> It gets inserted into the book. Now, I have to tell you that as a parent who was often um, not home during bedtime for my child because I was teaching at night, I think that would have been fun to read a book out loud and have my read aloud available for my child. A new way of looking at activities that feature into books was found recently in this particular book by Alan Miguch. And it's the look and find book where you look at a very busy, a Waldo-like book and then you look to see um, where a particular detail is. Now this is an example of a feature that makes sense because what this book is about is looking for details and finding them. So they have a photo album and you can collect pictures to put in your photo album. And I'm moving the camera around now on this page. And once I find the picture, I click. Now I intentionally clicked not right on it. And then it tells me, try again. And the earlier one that I had it muted on was when it said, try again, because I didn't quite catch it right. So this is one that makes sense. The only thing that I uh, wish is that these illustrations are from another era. And I think that we today would not have the kind of images that you see as in this one or throughout here, where Germany today doesn't look like this anymore. There's much more of a diversity and I think would hope that it's a clever thing to do to be able to make this kind of book, but I wish that there would be a new generation that would feature people of diversity in their illustrations. So, successful future for original story apps will happen, and these are the three key features that we'll be looking at. They look at new possibilities, they think in non-linear ways, and they keep in mind how children learn. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly a, an example of one that was made by Nosy Crow, and it shows you how there's an interactive part in which we have reading that is being done.
but then if you tap on the character, they also say other things in speech bubbles. So again, the tapping makes sense. And then the action that I'm, I'm actually lifting it with my finger into the ball now propels the story forward. And if you look closely, you can see that I'm in the mirror. <laughs> because the interactive feature on this is whoever's holding and reading it is featured in that mirror in the story. Um, this one's a made-for-tablet story, originally made. And this is what I mean by nonlinear example. And in this nonlinear example, what we see is, um, again, available in many languages. I had it set on Portuguese when I, st I started this particular one. So I go and change the language. And after I change the language, it's putting the animals to sleep. And because they're putting the animals to sleep, it doesn't have to be in a particular order. This no. is a nonlinear story. And what we start seeing is in the dark, there are lights that are still being left on. And if you choose a window, then you see the animal that's inside it. And it says, good night, sheep, time to go to sleep. Good night, cows, time to go to sleep. And so you can learn this in any language as you change languages throughout. I think this could be quite interesting for people who don't speak a particular other language because the words are so easily remembered and repeated throughout. So we're going, moving very, this is an annoying thing. I don't like to buy new animals as I go along. <laughs> Things where you can touch this little lightning rod and change the child from having two mothers to two fathers or a mother and a father throughout the book. Very clever as a feature, but very not good storyline. I think they need to work with a literary editor to um, develop that one. A feature in which you spin the child into outer space and then there's no gravity. And so then when you move the iPad from side to side, the child floats in outer space. Or a book of thinking about your careers. So you take a picture of yourself with your iPad and then after it takes your picture, you become the character throughout the book as you're thinking about what careers you might pursue. We have child narrators who read stories out loud. And we have books that scroll down instead of side to side. And we have, as again Jackie mentioned yesterday, story in progress, where it says, OK, tell us what you think so far, and we'll, we'll build some more to it. Or things that have what's called Easter eggs dropped in. So according to the date of your tablet, the background changes from Halloween to Christmas or to whatever other holiday is around. New apps that are being developed that are based on completely new, I'm sorry, uh, new stories so that we see this mole digging through the underground and you choose your own adventure. The mole goes to a stopping point and you can choose which path to take. And depending on which one you choose, the outcome is going to be different. And an underground mole has lots of choices to be able to be made throughout this one. Informational books is the area in which we're doing our research now. Um, having moved from the story world into the informational world, and we're looking at new apps that are um, c looking at ways to illustrate that are anatomically correct ways in which frogs move, but the, moving the frog propels the story so that we start to understand more about what happens. Lots of features in this one to consider, but one of the considerations is it's an, an, a story embedded within information and not just straightforward expository text. Um, Barefoot World Atlas. I have mixed feelings about this one. I think it's very clever on one level that you can spin the globe, land on a country, and find out some facts about it. But when you only tell four facts about a country, you can't help but reduce it to a few iconic symbols and not look very broadly for what that country represents. Probably one of the biggest areas of possibilities from a school perspective is the fact that there are some things being developed right now where you can change readabilities so that you have one book one set of illustrations, and you can choose beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And what you see in this demonstration is um, a way in which the same book is shown. Amazing and strange thing. Oh, Prezi light movement here. <laughs> and this is at the beginning level, so the text is read aloud and fairly simple. Why do the ants do this? And then I'm going to slide it over to being an intermediate level, and you'll see that the text got much more difficult, but still addressing the same content. And then when I slide my finger across that bottom thing to the next one, the text is at a much higher level, but still 
focused on the same information. And this is a way to adapt how information is shared across multiple reading levels within the same group of children. So again, this is a new area in which I'm starting to do my research and looking at the reference and study materials that go along with all of these. But frankly, in some of the decisions making that we're doing, I think this is the area of big hope. Lots of reader response through games, activities and fun, but really these are not about the literature, they're about the ways in which children can play and learn about what they are doing and respond through scaffolded story writing and such, but it's not about the literature itself. And as you can see, she's very engaged with creating her story and then she can create a whole bookshelf full of many books that she creates. And the one last thing I want to say about apps is that they're constantly updated. In one update alone, I took a screenshot of all the different ways in which my apps were being updated. So app developers are never finished. Books, once in print, unless there's a huge error or becomes out of date, are constantly updated. Apps are never finished. They can be updated without you even knowing what's happening. So making informed choices, with content going digital, I hope that it starts with reference. I mean, Encyclopedia Britannica is no longer being produced. I think the Oxford English Dictionary is under consideration. Informational books, novels, chapter books, and such, and I hope and feel that picture books is going to be the last area in which we will go digital with all of this. But I do believe that our future will find coexistence of print, oral, and digital, but we hope with more informed choices than we have at present. Thank you very much for your time.